So I'm happy you're here in this moment. And I hope that this talk offers some space to slow down um, so you can feel free to let it kind of wash over you. It's concerned with questions of environment and atmosphere. So I don't know. I think taking that seriously means trying to sort of relax into the space that is produced by what I'm about to read. And I hope that that space feels sort of not frenetic or reactive, um, which is the way I've been feeling given all of the sort of horrible trans antagonistic legislation that we get new news about every day. Um, and I imagine it's the way some of the organizers feel. I've heard about the Zoom bombings and the sort of virtual trans antagonism, or maybe not trans antagonism, just virtual antagonism, anti-feminist uh, antagonism, um, et cetera, that's been happening in the space of the conference. So, so yeah, I hope this helps you chill out a little bit. And maybe it won't, I don't know, but I'm just gonna start. Um, so I'll probably read for a little over half an hour and then we'll open it up for Q and A. And yeah, the talk is called Weathering, Slow Arts of Trans Endurance. It's the onset of winter 2022, or at least it was when I started writing this. The light gray sky is settling in and the ground soggy with melt from the first snows. I'm waking up early and sitting in front of a sun lamp, determined that this year I'll finally be able to stave off the descent of the strange assemblage that some of us call seasonal affective disorder. With the blue-white light blasting the depression from my body, that's how it works, right? I read a short story about a kid who decides to be a boy, then changes their mind and becomes a girl, then outgrows that and becomes a rock, then a mountain, then decides to leave Earth and enter orbit, to become a moon, a space crater still, somehow, despite all the distance, in touch with the kin she's left on Earth, kin that loved her through each one of these changes though often with difficulty and some measure of anger about the upsets these transitions produced as they reverberated throughout their intensely coimbricated lives. The story is titled Rock Jenny, and it's in Calamangus's beautiful collection of short stories and natural history of transition. Jenny is the name of the kid who becomes a boy, then a girl, then a rock, then a mountain, then the moon. While she's a mountain, her lover Zeph spray paints her name on, quote, the part of her hip he could reach from the ground. When she becomes a rock, her mother, conveniently a professor of geology, is very keen to know what kind of rock she has become, as that will reveal the sort of pressure she was under. It turns out she's sedimentary, quote, layering over time until she became a mix of something else, her mom says, just like she wanted. The narrator of the story leads us through a meditation on the indiscernibility of the rock that Jenny has become to both specialist and lay audiences. Quote, over time, sedimentary layers get compressed and twisted. Great upheavals scramble acres of desire and frustration and loneliness until they become so mixed up, even the most expert geologists abandon the possibility of untangling dates and seismic events. Rocks like Jenny have great waves inside of them, like the ocean, only slower, end quote. Rock Jenny exists in the same time space, but occupies incommensurate and opaque temporal and affective scales, which is a Baroque way of saying no one quite knows why Jenny is the way she is, but she nevertheless is. The isness of existence is obvious, factic, dense, weighty, and undeniable. It's just that the range of forces, collaborations, and convolutions is too thick for usual, even very finely honed, faculties of discernment. We, the readers, her beloveds, those who might be disposed to ponder questions of causality, to find out what makes Jenny tick, what motivates all these transformations, ultimately can't know. Quote, she carried on thinking in rhythms indecipherable to passersby, Angus writes. She could feel their every footfall, while her dreams registered to them as only minor rockfalls. The day comes when Jenny informs her family that she's planning to leave the earth, 
to enter orbit as a moon. They've built an entire cottage industry around the mountain that she's become, with trails that cater to outdoors people and a beloved diner at her base. And they're worried about the ways her departure and absence, the literal crater she will leave behind, the size of several Olympic swimming pools, will upset the stability of their everyday. But leave she does, insisting on the validity of a decision to change again and then again. The crater she left behind, quote, changed on its own in a succession of tiny grasses, weeds, clumps of purple vetch, daisies, and cattails that loved the damp bottom. She outlives her family and the structures they had thrown together, its uneven topography furthering a slow but steady erosion of the topsoil. There is the rather obvious, though nevertheless true, despite its banality, message relayed here that the only constant is change, that every sense of stasis or sameness is only temporary, that living itself is a ceaseless transition experienced at scales sometimes more, sometimes less perceptible. A variation on Octavia Butler's Earthseed aphorism, all that you touch you change, all that you change changes you, the only lasting truth is change. Rock Jenny affirms this and in doing so, turns the conventional expectation that transition happens, or at least should happen, once and only once on its head. The story affirms something other than what I'm tempted to call the validity of transness, a phrase that sounds lukewarm and is. Rather, it affirms indecision in revision, choosing and then deciding to choose again differently. These decisions don't happen in a vacuum. They impact and are impacted by the lives of others. And these impacts leave perceptible craters, but they aren't ambushed by interrogation. Jenny's intimates respect her opacity. They don't saddle her with the demand of confession. They don't weaponize a will to know against her. And perhaps more importantly, they don't presume that she herself has such answers in advance of the existential experiment she's about to embark upon. Such respect is a practice of care and a way of doing justice to the simultaneity of deep interwovenness and profound otherness that shapes any intimacy. The process portrait of Jenny that Angus gives us moves beyond depicting this respect for opacity, though it might be thought of as a minimal requirement for the world on offer in the story. He gives an account attentive to questions of pressure and environment, the impinging and interactive forces that co-construct Jenny. From her mother's intent discernment of the forms of pressure that have made her the way she is, sedimentary rather than metamorphic or igneous, to the increasingly frequent, thanks to anthropogenic climate change, rains that had stripped her down to bedrock where erosion was slower but more painful, deepening the scars in her topsoil, exposing fossilized memories of mammals and more peculiar hurt she'd long unthought, that's from Angus. Readers are gifted a vivid depiction of the entwinement of subject and environment, the corporeal and the atmospheric. Angus literalizes the crucial role of environment, attentive to the ways it supports agentic capacity, the ways it wears down in a way, the ways it collaboratively transforms, and the ways it changes in the wake of leave takings. This is a consistent element in his stories, which often feature characters who turn to the natural cultural surround, forest, quarries, as sources of inchoate support and plenitude in the midst of otherwise hostile situations. While reading and thinking with Rock Jenny, and more specifically the imbrication of environment and transition in Angus's work, I found myself turning to Eve Sedgwick's posthumously published essay, The Weather and Proust, the lead essay in the titular collection edited by Jonathan Goldmer, Goldberg after Sedgwick passed. As I was reading it, news broke of Goldberg's passing, so that I was reading it with a more finely grained attention to questions of finitude and grief than usual, even while beginning an essay about existential endurance. That day, a friend texted to ask what, to ask what I was writing on. I wrote back survival and some other stuff. The next day I saw her, she said she laughed when she read the text because that's what I'm always writing about. What else is there? 
extinction, I suppose, the different scales at which death occurs from being to species, from individual to kind. Anyway, I was reading Sedgwick. The essay is ostensibly about Proust, who I have never read, though, like many academics in the humanities, I suspect, I have meant to in a rather half-hearted way for many years. Then there is the other camp, my partner belongs to this camp, those who have started, endured for a while, then halted, promising to return and finish one day, but the day just never seems to come. I mentioned this to say that I'd arrive there at the opening pages of The Weather and Proust, mostly for what Sedgwick has to say about the weather, which exceeds, as weather systems tend to, the scope of Proust's work. I'm interested in the changing weather, like probably all of us, for a few reasons. One is that charting its increasingly regularized anomalies marks the slow march of climate change at the scale of the everyday, making it psychically comprehensible. Another is that someone I love dearly spent years unhoused in Miami, which made every hurricane season a source of great anxiety and unrest. My concern for their safety was modulated, intensified or assuaged by the weather report in the absence of regular contact. This is why I suspect parents often check the weather forecast for the places where their children live as well. Another is that I live when not working mostly outside, honestly, running, climbing, hiking, biking, which renders the weather a constant concern. But perhaps most importantly for the purposes of this essay is a small admission. As a child, I would routinely zone out while watching the weather channel, which was a habit I had picked up from long days being babysat by my grandfather who entered a daily fugue state in front of Local on the Eights with its alternating soundtrack of smooth jazz and classical guitar. This attachment was a way of distancing from a domestic environment that was tumultuous often, violent sometimes. The Weather Channel held me. It was comfortingly routine in its programming and dedicated to forecasting the future, possessed of a kind of clairvoyance that I found deeply reassuring. One could know what the next day would hold, or at least make a reasonable prediction concerning it. When Sedgwick writes about the weather, she considers its privileged place in discussions of complexity and frames it as a topic that dramatizes the relations between open and closed systems, a topos or space where, quote, the absolutely rule-bound cyclical economy of advanced human computational powers and the irreducibly unpredictable contingency of the actual weather have come to be conceptualized together, end quote. Talking about the weather is another way of talking about holding environments, a term Cedric pulls from psychoanalyst and pediatrician D.W. Winnicott and summarizes as the providence of a protecting and nurturing environment that makes it possible for the infant to think about something else, something beyond the mother's care. And for Winnicott, it's always a mother, although, of course, I have questions about that. A holding environment is an environment wherein one's basic needs to breathe, to eat and drink, to have one's weight supported are satiated. While the holding environment for Winnicott and Sedgwick and Sedgwick's reading of Proust is grounded in the infant maternal relation, so-called healthy development necessitates the sustaining of such a holding environment as one's social sphere widens. The concept echoes one of the key demands of movements for reproductive justice the right to parent children in safe and healthy environments. Of course, not all environments hold, not all weather systems are decent. One of the key fascinations of Proust's work for Sedgwick is when his narrator describes himself as an animated barometer or as containing a little barometric mannequin within. Sedgwick calls this barometric mannequin a buoyant internal homunculus that responds to atmospheric pressure, which, quote, compared to the much more obvious alternatives, temperature, wind, precipitation, even humidity, is a subtle, invisible, and indivisibly systemic index of weather that means nothing at all outside of a dynamic interpretive context. Invisible for all its pervasiveness, she writes, atmospheric pressure, like the air itself, is easy for most people most of the time to take for granted. In this way, it is like the holding environment, notable primarily when it is compromised or precarious, 
Otherwise, it is surprisingly pervasive, surprisingly easy to lose sight of, like the weather. For Sedgwick, this internal barometer offers a way of thinking through the porosity of the subject, the relation between an internal object and an ambient surround. It also works, works as a model for a kind of invagination. I kind of hate this term, despite its popularity with some thinkers I find useful. An opening of the inside to the other that disrupts the friction of a stable, fixed differentiation between the internal and the external, between the subject and what's both within and beyond it. Sedgwick writes, quote, the beings in the universe are filled in turn, like human barometers, with the stuff of the universe. This is as true for art as it is for the irreducibly complex systems and substances that constitute the weather, end quote. She remains curiously positive about this relation, making the internal barometer the figure that makes sense of the openness of the subject to the new, the rupturing of closed systems, the delight of surprise, engagement with the mystic, and the beautiful density of the rich inner life, with Proust's work for her operating as an exemplar of all of these. Another simpler way to put this, for her, at least in this essay, the environment always holds. The holding environment is what makes possible engagement with art, metaphysics, spirituality, all that lies beyond survival, the something else that a holding environment enables one to think. As theorist Steven Sporberg notes, her text sublimates bad weather. Shifts in the weather signal a revivifying arrival of the new, the unexpected, the surprising, the refreshing. An openness to being immersed in such shifts indicates a willingness of the self to be transformed. I'm drawn to Sedgwick's likening of one's awareness of the complexity of a surrounding milieu to an internal barometer of sorts, one that tracks the subtleties of and shifts in atmospheric pressure. It feels like an accurate way of thinking what might otherwise be called affective attunement in its corresponding degrees, from detachment to hyper-awareness. Sedgwick seems drawn to characters that have exquisitely sensitive internal barometers. I'd wager that for her, Proust himself is one of these. Indeed, she writes that, quote, everything in Proust depends on the ratio or relation between an internal object and an ambient surround. Inequality between them or a collapse of either of them leads to a collapse of the whole ecology of value and vitality, end quote. Where our orientations or perhaps preoccupations is a better word differ, I suspect, subsist in our own habits of attunement. Much of the trans art and literature that I'm drawn to, that I routinely think with, that I find resonant, if not exactly a source of repair and conciliation, is rendered in the midst of the collapse of whole ecologies. It doesn't lament or seek to restore disequilibrium. It's rooted in it, committed to exploring what it means to subsist and persist in and through such collapse. These thinkers, artists, writers want to understand, to paraphrase the mother in Angus's rock, Jenny, again, the kinds of pressures we are under. It is a, as it is impossible to understand the forms we take, the forms we have taken otherwise. There is a scene in Tori Peters' Detransition Baby that I think of often, in part because I find it heartbreaking, in part because I find it hilarious, that it manages to be each of these things to route the heartbreak through the hilarity is I think a hallmark of Peters' genius. Toward the end of the novel, Reese, one of the central characters, a trans woman who is working through the complexities of planning to co-parent with her ex Ames, listen carefully to this part because it gets kind of convoluted if you haven't read the book, um, planning to co-parent with her ex Ames, who is detransitioned and is with a cis woman named Katrina, who is pregnant via sex with Ames. Okay, that's a lot, but hopefully you followed. Details her interest in Wim Hof, a quote, weird ass Dutchman known as the Iceman who developed a method to withstand extreme pain that has come to be known as the Wim Hof method, a combination of breathing exercises and cold endurance trials, beginning with cold showers and moving to immersion in frozen lakes. 
intended to help adherents withstand pain and even control autonomic bodily systems like blood flow or adrenaline. That's all from Detransition Baby. She was introduced to the method by a date who had started exploring it to deal with his erectile dysfunction in order to take control of his erections again by, quote, freezing himself beyond performance anxiety before any intimacy, end quote. It turns out that it works, or at least seems to. Reese reports that though, quote, his skin was so cold that she felt as though she were embracing a corpse, the guy fucked like a god, end quote. Afterwards, they watch a short Vice documentary about Wim Hof, described by Peters as a typical Vice piece, a credulous white guy doing things he ought not to, filmed in neutered gonzo style, end quote. And Reese becomes intrigued after learning that Hoff had lost his wife to suicide. Peters writes that she let herself become captivated by him, even as she found him ridiculous. She enjoyed this take on stoic masculinity, the tragic man who loves a woman enough that the loss of her makes submersion in a frozen pond appealing by comparison. A romantic view of the stoic, one that's maybe tragic itself. Years later, Reese, grieving, finds herself on the shores of Riss Beach, the queer beach that combines the worst parts of a high school lunchroom with the worst parts of a nightclub, Peters writes, only everyone is also nearly naked, in May, on the very first warm day of the season. The water is still frigid. Remembering Wim Hof and how his cold immersion enabled him to find this place beside pain but not in pain, she wades in and wades out until she's completely submerged. The beach is crowded though, and she's promptly rescued by a quote, rent boy muscle queen in a neon blue speedo, who's wasted enough to not feel the cold. The assumption is the attempted suicide. She tries to explain that it's not, repeating Wim Hof method over and over. But the boundary is unclear. The pursuit of a place beside pain, but not in pain risks the no place of death. Watching the real documentary that the fictional date recommends to Reese, which I have a few times now, it becomes clear that the difference between death and healing is a matter of incremental and intensifying exposure, coupled with breathing and cognitive strategies that enable one to psychosomatically endure longer and longer immersions. Over time, the body acquires higher levels of brown adipose tissue which enables one to maintain a higher core temperature even while submersed in freezing water. The body finds the form it needs to endure. It transforms in response to the kind of pressure it is under. Reese is obsessed with Wim Hof because he has taught himself to endure what would otherwise annihilate. There's definitely something ubermenschy at work in Hof's narration of his method. It's about learning to rise above what the world throws at you. Agency is enhanced, the subject overcomes. In a memorable scene, Dutch philosopher René Hudde, who had been given a grim cancer prognosis and managed to outlive it by quite a bit, says, train your body, man. I'm not easily convinced, but I'm always looking for something that gives me some control in this fucking situation, referring to his cancer. You have a life expectancy of two months and then you're out of control. Maybe it's the same with the autonomous, uh, autonomous, autonomous immune system. I would like to be autonomous myself a little. Hood had died in 2015, seven years after his initial diagnosis. The internal barometer senses shifts in atmosphere, oncoming onslaughts, moments of paradisiacal balance, everything in between. But it doesn't tell you how to endure it. When the question is survival, how one weathers the weather is the paramount and constant concern. Sedgwick suggests that access to an adequate holding environment is key. Hoff teaches how it is one might hold themselves. That Reese has learned by such a lesson doesn't surprise me. That such a lesson amounts to microdosing exposure to hostile environments doesn't surprise me either. I turned back to Sedgwick's thinking about whether, after reading Eric Stanley's Atmospheres of Violence, Structuring Antagonism in the Trans-Queer Ungovernable, 
Stanley's work is grounded in a practice of thinking from always racialized trans and queer experiences of near life and slow death. That is, experiences of structural abjection, assignment to zones of non-existence, violent obliteration, and intense marginalization. They use the phrase trans slash queer, not as an identity marker, but instead to mark, quote, the moment when race, non-normative sexuality and genders, and force materialized at what they call the impasse of subjectivity. Their archive, the lives and brutal unjust deaths through which they chart an emergent theory of radical ungovernability, is, as Termaline attests on the book's back cover, devastating. They write against the grain of the popular celebratory narratives that circulate about Black trans icons like Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, and Miss Major, as well as through the experiences of police brutality, suicide, and carceral abuse of less well-known trans and gender nonconforming folks like Seth Walsh, Duana Johnson, and Ashley Diamond. Stanley finds in the complexity of these life stories, rich practices of survival within and against the death-dealing apparatuses of racial capitalism. Accompanied by them, they render hostile situations with careful, nearly forensic detail to build an account of trans queer survival within a suffocating surround. Another name for this surround is atmosphere. Atmospheres suffuse, infuse, seep, absorb, infiltrate, creep, inundate, saturate, encompass. Because of the porosity of flesh and world, they get into you, you get into them. They're everywhere and no place simultaneously, tangible, but not able to be isolated. They can be benign, miasmic, or curative which is why Stanley modulates the term with the word violence when they're talking about trans and queer lives. There is no total escape from a violent atmosphere, though there are zones of reprieve, spaces that operate as what C. Riley Snorton, following Harriet Jacobs and Sadia Hartman, terms loopholes of retreat. Interstitial spaces of freedom within captivity, temporary environments of holding within broader nested systems of domination. I want to pause here for a second to pull up and share my screen. Just give me one moment. Um, the last part of this talk looks in detail at a, a couple of artworks. So give me one more second. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay, I think so. So, I think of Jess Fon's work, which is what I have up here, specifically those concerning systems, systems two and systems three from 2018. Known for rendering objects of perhaps grotesque, always sublime beauty with politically charged biological materials like estrogen, testosterone, melanin, urine, semen, and blood, in these pieces, he constructs apparatuses that function as elaborate scaffolds, those ubiquitous support structures that make renovation possible. Upon these scaffolds rest glass globules, with some spaces seemingly purpose-built for supporting the specific shape of a particular amorphous form. Within the globules, testosterone, estrogen, and melanin are suspended in silicone, held within the once fluid, then plastic, now fragilely static glass. He says in multiple interviews that he works with glass because he's interested in process, flux, becoming. But he also seems to be interested in de-dramatizing the substances he suspends and contains within glass. He isolates that which ostensibly produces race and gender, what operates as a kind of biological substrate and allows the viewer to gaze upon the thing itself, these loaded, heavily regulated substances. He invites us to consider them as components in a broader assemblage that determines their stasis and circulation. He temporarily stops the flow and asks us to consider their place in a larger network that shapes their suspension and containment. 
At the conclusion of an Art 21 short about his work, he discloses a bit about his practice, but also his work ethic and his analyst, reporting, quote, my therapist says that I'm so familiar with oppression that danger and risk and oppression makes me feel at home. So I slave myself away in the studio or like I deprive myself of pleasure because I'm not oppressed as a queer being here, New York City and Brooklyn specifically, as opposed to his birthplace in Hong Kong. And he laughs and says, so I press myself now because I can't go back if I fail, you know? Fawn is describing something familiar, how it feels when the loophole of retreat becomes pressurized, when the atmosphere of violence is internalized, when that which had promised a possible future, a form of escape, some space to be and work more freely, comes to feel oppressive. When you find yourself reproducing conditions of unfreedom, even within an environment that mostly holds. Another theme in Fon's work, that it is the wound that produces beauty. The beauty in the sublime sense always contains a certain grotesquerie, a mark of harm or disruption. So I wanna to move to this next piece that I'll be talking about. Ceramicist Nikki Green is similarly concerned with phenomena of mutation, transformation, and flux, and with the production of holding environments. Such environments appear in Fawn's work via scaffolding and glass encasement. Green's work centers around the making of vessels like crocks, tubs, and pitchers. In Fawn's work, the non-porosity of glass enables the silicone suspension of substance a kind of snow globe effect, the production of a contained environment in miniature. It takes a more elaborate process to render ceramics non-porous, requiring glazing in addition to firing. And Nikki Green often only partially completes this process. In doing so, she refuses the injunction that a ceramic vessel must be watertight. Instead, she builds, and sometimes literally puts on a pedestal, leaky vessels, imperfect in the form of broken and sutured containers, and this is one of them. In a 2018 work, Mikvah for Mycotheology, and that's what I have up here, she reinvents the vessel for the Judaic ritual of purification via immersion in water. In this piece, the tub is broken into 24 pieces, with the lines of cleavage radiating from a central axis in the basin of the tub. The tub has been sutured back together with epoxy, hardware, and felt washers, but still sits in two halves. A Star of David is emblazoned on the floor of the basin, riven in two. The interior of the tub is glazed, the exterior left porous. Along the walls of the tub, beneath circular forms that appear to be lunar phases, circle sacral seeming androgynous figures, some harvesting mushrooms, others with their faces turned to the sky and arms upraised in the form of a priestly blessing. Healing work is happening, aided by the mycorrhizal inter interconnections that root and stitch together both the gathered mushrooms and the scene itself. Green, who's trans, Jewish, is meditating on the consequences of long histories of ritualized and systemic gender segregation, the incompletion and ongoingness of repair, and the difficulty of piecing together a broken holding environment. The piece seems to ask what it would take to be able to immerse and arise transformed together. What is the holding environment that would need to be built? What are the resources we have at hand? The process, as we see in this, this piece, is already underway. The immersive vision is no Wim Hof style endurance trial, though it is laborious. The work is collective, imperfect, and ongoing. All right, thank you all. That's the end of the talk, but I look forward to the Q&A. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Malatino. That was really moving and stunning, um, the way you wrote it, the insights that you delivered. Um, I want to now move us into Q&A, so um, I want to invite 
um, folks in the audience, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function to pose them. Um, and maybe while folks are uh, getting their thoughts together and putting things in that box, um, I have a question that I would love to ask uh, if I can use moderator privilege to do so. Um, I also think about holding environments a bunch in my work um, on sort of Asian American racial care. Um, and one of the things I think about um, is the way in which, as Winnicott, uh, you know, theorizes it, the holding environment is in many ways a sort of outcome of the, you know, to use a phrase that you use, the sort of caring interrelationality or just the caring labor of the mother, right? Um, and so I wonder um, if you can speak to uh, the kinds of trans care that you might imagine as being productive of the kind of holding environments that would do uh, more holding in the caring sense than perhaps in the carceral sense. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the question, right? Like, that's the question that's at the heart of this piece for me. Um, and the way, I think the way I want to start responding is first by thinking, probably covering a lot of ground that I covered in trans care, in part about the inadequacy of the familial model to think about these forms of care. So this is not to say that all trans people come from families characterized by broken holding environments, right? Like I would not make that argument. I don't think that's the right argument to make. But I think that if you maybe like me have a sort of attentiveness to the disruption of the holding environment and an emphasis on the sort of violence of normative familial forms, um, and you kind of have to pay a little bit of attention to the phenomenon of the holding environment that one may be familiar with as a child um not holding very well or holding discontinuously holding sometimes not holding other times right um and what that means when then thinking about moving through that crucible right of discontinuous holding or a sort of complicated environment that is both maybe antagonistic but supportive at the same time or in increments um combined with what it means to occupy a pretty fundamentally transantagonistic public sphere and you know set of institutional spaces as one comes of age. It means that by the time I think most folks are grappling with questions of trans collectivity and for political ethics of care, like all of these things that I've written about, um, they're trying to strategize and trying to engage in forms of political practice and care work. Um, In a very different, with a very different kind of history at work than the history that you see sort of idealized within the work of Winnicott, right? Where he's focused on the broken holding environment and all of the trauma and trouble that causes, but he's also really rather prescriptive, right? And Winnicott, like famously, and you probably know about this, James, right, would go on the radio and broadcast advice to mothers um, just about how to rear their children. So there's a deeply prescriptive element at work in his writing on holding environments. And I think I'm, I've been just more concerned with like, well, what do we do when the holding environment fails to hold, right? As it so often does, especially for multiply marginalized subjects, especially for non-white people, especially for trans folks of color, right? Especially for queer, queer folks and queer folks of color. So like with that in mind, right? How does this complicate care labor or care work? Um, but also how does it give rise to different forms of care work? So this is all a preface to the question that you asked <laughs> in some ways, right? Because I haven't gotten to talking about like concrete practices. Um, also, can you hear my dog barking in the background? Okay, he's pretty loud, but like, I'm gonna try to try to focus. You really can't um, hear it. Okay, that's great, that's great. So I certainly can. So <laughs> I'm gonna okay. try to gain my attention on the response. Um, okay, so I had that long preamble, but I also think the present moment, right, and in this intense transantagonistic legislation that I think some folks feel, depending on your positionality, is like coming out of nowhere, but then other folks who maybe have been exposed to some of this legislation, right, in prior iterations in past years and even past decades, absolutely understand is not coming out of nowhere, right? Like it's a long game that's been played by a sort of evangelical conservative, right? Faction or series of factions yeah. connecting. Um, I think one of the worst impacts of it is that it puts 
trans folks and right folks with political affinities with trans folks across all of the differences, right? Um, in a position of defensive reactivity. And it's very hard to mobilize like for the long haul and build infrastructures of care that don't rely on normative familial and kinship structures and that don't merely seek inclusion within existing institutional spaces, um, it compromises our ability to do that work, right? Because that work is not merely defensive or reactive. And this is not to say that it's not important to react, of course it is, but like part of the strategy that's being deployed against folks, trans folks, folks on the left, right? Um, in this moment is, is, it's about producing this constant affective sense of panic and horror and disgust that makes building infrastructure really hard, right? So, okay, I'll stop, I'll stop there knowing I haven't fully answered your question, but I've just been thinking through the problematics, right? No, that's so great. That's so great. And if I could, I could ask a, a follow-up and I see, I see a question that's been put on our end of the chat at least. Um, but uh, I'm really drawn to the language that you're giving us to think about, um, you know, a number of things, care, suffering, we could say affect, um, and the language that you're using is a sort of taking from Eric Stanley atmosphere, right? Um, ambient, internal barometer, and in particular to pressure, right? And I'm wondering what this vocabulary gives you um, that the language that you've used in earlier work um, doesn't give you, right? So inside affects, you're thinking very particularly about specific, you know, emotions, basically. Um, and, and, and a turn to pressure and the atmospheric and the weather and, and all of these sort of metaphorical uh, languages um, gets us somewhere else that I see trans studies, you know, sort of mirroring, uh, and you're obviously working within that milieu. So I wonder if you could just talk about um, the, the, the choice around those terminologies. Yeah, I mean, in part, it's because the weather's fucking bad. <laughs> like, I mean, and, the, and the weather is bad both metaphorically right but also literally the weather is it, I mean it, it's routinely horrifying right we had a record high today in Pennsylvania I was teaching my classes outside and we were all like it was winter last week and now it's 90 degrees like this same is, here same here not quite yeah. as hot but yeah <laughs> yeah so this is just a routine right a routine phenomenon but the emphasis on questions of of atmosphere on questions of weather, it's not only just because the weather is bad, but it also is sort of giving me a way to think about, I spent years thinking about the subjective impact of trans antagonism at the level of affective experience, right? Which is what side affects is all about. Um, all of the bad feelings that certain forms of trans antagonism engender. And atmosphere, weather, all of that allows me to think about the broader environment, but without thinking about questions of institutional reform or turning to, to just an attention on structure, right? Because there's an affective dimension to thinking about weather, atmosphere, environment that I don't think is quite there when we use the language of, of structure. And it's not that that language is bad, but I'm really curious about um, something beyond the structural, right? So that also informs the structure, the structural and informs infrastructures of survival because those infrastructures have to be malleable in relationship to the broader environment. So, so sort of all of that is in these words, right? Ambience, atmosphere, environment. And it enables one to sort of toggle between the subject and the structure and, um, and the weather in a way that it can happen simultaneously. Mm. So I think that's really why it's attractive. Um, mm. And then also just how saturating it is, right? I mean, part of when Stanley, and I highly recommend reading, reading Atmospheres of Violence, if you haven't read it already for the folks in the audience, um, when Stanley talks about atmosphere, they talk about it in just this really beautiful way because it is unavoidable, it's unescapable, right? There's no, you might be able to get out of the weather for a little while, but you always have to go back out into it. You can't pretend it doesn't exist and no one can pretend it doesn't exist indefinitely. Mm. And I, so there's a, there's a sort of general, a commons or a collectivity to the experience of the weather that I think is interesting, right? Is a political metaphor, but also 
actually just as a shared reality. Yeah, totally, totally. And super helpful and gets us to think about the climatological in a way that I think is interesting. Um, but we do have a question um, from Angela Town um, who asks, what does the structure look like? And maybe we could also add the infrastructure look like if it's not familial or institutional inclusion. Do you have an example? By the way, I love this concept of loophole of reprieve. Yeah, I mean, I think there are lots of examples. Um, I've been obsessed, and this is like, this is no secret to, for anyone who knows me. I've been obsessed with um, histories of collective utopic experiments and mm -hmm. also just histories of like communal living um, undertaken by trans and queer folks, but also just undertaken like, I've been reading about the shakers in the Oneida community um, off and on for a long time, which is very much out of my wheelhouse right, in a lot of ways. <laughs> but um, it is deeply problematic, both of those iterations, deeply problematic for so many reasons. Um, but I think I pay a lot of attention to communal experiments because those are efforts to inhabit cracks in, to build infrastructure in the broader structural cracks and sort of most of what I write about is US-based, right? So US institutional life. Um, and even though a lot of these experience are, experience, experiments are failed, right, in the formal sense, there is this sort of, to paraphrase Munoz, right, this, like this utopic horizon that's at work that fuels people's experiments with very different kinds of economies, with very different kinds of romantic and intimate relationships. Um, the, I mean, they don't cohere around the family or they re-envision family in such a way that it is dispersed, it is extended, right? Um, instead of nucleated in the very Eurocentric Western sort of modern conceptions of the family that we're all, I, I think, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever, um, familiar with. So, so there's that. And then there are also contemporary mutual aid projects that do the same work of organizing in these sort of cracks. Um, and developing strategies for caretaking outside of the state, recognizing the inadequacy of the state to ever adequately offer such care. So, and there are lots of different projects, right, that one could list there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like experiments in communality and in developing or re-envisioning what a commons might look like, um, and then mutual aid projects, which do that, right? But maybe in more piecemeal and less sort of, um, deliberately utopic and highly planned ways. Totally, totally. I share that obsession. And um, this question that we've got in the chat um, is maybe gonna ask you to uh, think down the same line of thought, but just maybe a little bit further in a particular direction. So I'll just read it. Um, it comes out of uh, the student reading guide uh, for side effects. Um, the infrapolitical ethics of care is defined by you as a reliance on a community of friends to protect and defend one from violence to witness and mirror each other's rage and empathy and to support one another during and after the breaking that accompanies rage. That's on page 118 for folks following along at home. Um, where have you seen infrapolitical ethics of care show up in your communities? And you've sort of answered um, this to some extent, but um, more specifically, what role might it play in abolition? Um, if you're willing to jump into that line of thought with us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, abolition is fundamentally in for political work, I think, right? It's because it's not about institutional reform. It's not about the transformation of structures. It's about the demolition of structures. Um, and what needs to be in place, right, as those structures are sort of gradually chipped away at and hopefully eventually entirely eroded, are alternative systems that help us meet the sort of both the basic existential needs that bodies have, right? But also like um, the desires, the differential desires that folks have. And if abolition marks a specific loss of faith, right? Or disinvestment in institutional life as usual and in the state, right? Um, then its main motor is infrapolitics and and the care work that makes infrapolitical building possible. Yeah, great. Um, okay, we have gratitude in the chat. Um, what do we do about uh, 
care webs, interrelationships of care, um, communal experiments, and the problem of likability, right? <laughs> um, the, the, you know, there are difficult people in some of the works that you've cited, right? <laughs> um, weird people, strange people. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Leah Lakshmi Pipes Nessa Marissinga saying that, uh, uh, you know, you shouldn't have to be likable to achieve care. Um, but how, how do, how do uh, we build these sort of infrastructures um, given that there are people that we just don't want to be around sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important just to remind, this is a great question. And I think it's important to just say, right, that we, if we've ever lived in a more sort of traditional familial structure, we're probably very familiar with <laughs> doing care work for people we really don't fucking like. And maybe that's shady to say, right? <laughs> right? But like, <laughs> there's, I mean, feminists like, you know, feminists the tea, too. are very, right? They're very sort of pointed about saying care work happens all the time, even in the most sort of conventional ways. Um, despite the fact that there might be a really, really minimal or maybe even non-existent, like intimate affective bond at work. Um, you might be recruited as a caregiver for an aging parent who you are entirely estranged from, right? That happens in families all the time. Um, there are mothers that maybe like love their kids, um, but some days definitely aren't super into having them in the moment who nevertheless do like imperative care work. So, and what justifies that in the family is this, or not what justifies, but what sort of, um, makes that an ethical obligation in the family is this the like trump card of biological relatedness i think um so the question is then if we're thinking about this outside of normative familial structures how this operates um where is the sense of obligation or duty like where is that located um and i think it's it's probably related to understanding one another's futures is collectively coimbricated whether or not we like one another, right? The forces that are arrayed against us don't care whether we like one another or not. So our ability to build infrastructures of resistance should not hinge on personal like or dislike. Um, that's also easier said than done because it's really hard to work with folks, right? If there's a lot of internal dissensus. And it's also really hard when folks have you know, complicated histories of trauma that inform the way that they navigate spaces of collectivity. Um, and it's important to make space for that. And I think this is when um, like MAD studies, care work and disability studies and some of the work that I've done converge. Um, yeah, so those are some preliminary thoughts about that. Like a belief shouldn't matter, right? I agree with Piazza Samarasin about that entirely. Um, but also, how do we deprioritize that in like consensus building and in collaborative collective work? Yeah, totally. And I would That's argue that those oh, were those. No, no, no. I would just argue that those were much more than preliminary thoughts on the matter. Um, and we have a question um, from Sebastian Barr, um, who asks. I'm very interested in the idea of building community and collective structures with people who are likely to have come from holding environments that quote failed to hold. There are profound relational and intrapsychic impacts of these failed holding environments that may then be reenacted or make care work and relationships particularly challenging. I'm thinking particularly about trust and intimacy, wondering how you envision making room for that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think what I wanna say first is these, these debates are so old, right? If you're like a, a, like a, a student of social movements, um, and even thinking about the, just the stuff about communes that I mentioned earlier, um, even on like very like cishet hippie communes, right? Mm -hmm. The debates that people had and the like the material traces of these debates in the archives about gendered housework, right? And all of that um, and sexual work too, right? Like sexual labor within the context of communal life um, is marked by histories of trauma. And in some ways, Right, intimacy and trauma are always bound up with one another. I don't think I know anybody that that doesn't have that going on. Right, <laughs> um, 
which is not to say, okay, because it's common or because it's general, right? That means that's the end of the story. Um, but I mentioned it to say, I suspect we're all already doing that kind of work. Um, and that it's hard for me to generalize about in a way because that work is so, in some ways, idiosyncratic to particular relationships. Um, so the question of how to make space for it, I think has to sort of focus on the singularity of particular sets of relationships and the singularity of needs that people bring. Um, well, at the same time, making space for, for processing, right? But also making space for reprieve, um, space for removal from, from collective or social situations when they become too overwhelming. And that's an, that's an accessibility need, right? That's an accommodation, I guess. But it's also so much more than that. Um, so there's a way in which what you ask opens out onto questions of space and also infrastructure again. Um, and I'm still thinking through, through that. It's like a sort of constant preoccupation of mine lately. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, and, and this question of space that you've just raised, um, it brings me to a line. Um, and you know, before I before I ask this question about this line that is um, itching at me, um, I just want to encourage folks to continue to put questions in the chat or or in uh, the Q and A box using the function on Zoom. Um, but the line um, that that is sticking with me right now from what you've uh, said in the talk, um, pursuit of a place beside pain, but not in pain, uh, risks the no place of death. The, the sort of spatiality of beside pain, but not in pain, um, it's just bringing up a lot of curiosity for me. And I'm wondering if you can sort of talk us through what you mean by that um, and, and, and what you're trying to get us to understand uh, with, with this uh, phrasing. Yeah, yeah. So that, okay, that, that's from the Wim Hof section. And there's something, I will just say it publicly, right? Like when I read the part in Detransition Baby about Wim Hof, I was like, oh my God, yeah. Like it's easy to be obsessed with this guy because he seems to have developed some system um, of dealing with just massive and like world transforming trauma and making it manageable. But the way that he made it manageable um, sort of runs in the face of contemporary therapeutic cultures. And yes, there's like a myth of rugged individualism and self-reliance that is a part of it. But actually, like if you start, and I'm not saying you should get obsessive about Wim Hof, right? <laughs> but, if, but if you happen to, um, there's a deep collective dynamic in the work that he does with people where he's like, he has these camps out in the wilderness, I forget where, some Eastern European country, where like people train to endure longer and longer periods of cold. And then at the end come out like transformed, right? Um, and I'm not saying I'm buying the Wim Hof stuff, but I am saying there's something metaphorically about this process of working directly with pain and trauma, right? In order to develop sort of physiognomic methods to deal with it that I think is interesting. Um, and it bears upon questions of ritual and, and transformation, like corporeal transformation. And I think that those deeply animate trans life, which is part of why I think Rhesus, like, oh yeah, I, I understand this Wim Hof stuff because there's a way in which so many trans folks develop different rituals that enable endurance um, that might happen in spaces of reprieve or loopholes of retreat, right? And that might happen collectively, but they're nevertheless about sort of developing skill sets to deal with, um, to deal with pain, right? And the sort of cyclical and reliable recurrence of pain. Um, and I think it is about developing a place beside pain, but not in it, right? Like there's something that feels true to me about that, even though I'm not necessarily saying we should all go like jump in freezing lakes, <laughs> right? <It's> like <laughs> yeah. there are ways in which I can see folks doing that or cultivating that capacity in so many different ways. And that is absolutely essential to endurance in the context of a broader political and social antagonism. That's helpful. Thank you. 
Thank you. There is a question um, in the chat. Um, that I sort of love because I'm always tempted to ask this question and always too intimidated to do so. Um, so uh, maybe I'll put the question like this. Can you, in plain language, um, just tell us what your point is? Um, tell us what your thesis is. Yeah, yeah. This is coming from a student who, you know, is, is yeah. curious. Yeah, I mean, so my thesis, and I mentioned this earlier, it's this idea that the political, the really anti-trans political environment that we're in, right now has us many of us at least feeling really panicked really like i don't know how to go on with life i don't know what the next day is going to hold i don't know if i'm going to be able to access transition related services i don't know if i'm going to be safe at school i don't know if i'm going to be taken away from my family right by child services because they're supporting my transition so i've been thinking about this political environment this is a long answer but hopefully it's easy to follow <laughs> And in thinking about it, I started thinking, okay, rather than thinking about like what the best strategy is to react to these attacks, which is of course, absolutely necessary. Another way to deal with it would be to kind of detach and look at the ways that trans people have always cultivated the ability to survive and endure in really hostile situations, right? Like structural trans antagonism is nothing new. We maybe had a few years where we were somehow, some of us maybe got convinced that it was a little bit better when it really wasn't for most of us. Um, but it's not new. And what that means is that strategies of, re of resistance and strategies of survival have long trajectories. Um, and it's important to become familiar with those trajectories. So that's why I think thinking about endurance is important. And I look at artists and at thinkers that are contemporary trans artists and thinkers who are grappling with similar questions. So that's part of what this talk is trying to do. But it's just one small piece of a work that I think is probably gonna be much bigger and that looks at historic instances of trans arts of survival and endurance. Mm. So hopefully that, hopefully that kind of got a little closer to the point. No, I think that was beautiful and, you know, helpful for me too, to, to hear and to listen to. Um, and I think that that raises the question um, that uh, one question we have in the chat, um, which is, so what are you working on now? What's next? What are you reading? Um, how are trans arts of survival and endurance um, different or similar from trans from what you call trans care? Um, and, and if I could tack on just a small addendum to that question, um, which is already seven questions, so I apologize. Uh, <laughs> where, where is the line between uh, endurance and burnout? Like, like, how do we think about those things in, this, in the same frame? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that is a lot of questions. Yeah. So one, it's not different from the work in trans care. Trans care was a really little book. And one of the most common critiques of the book is that it's too short and it doesn't oh. do all the things that people want. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, it's like by design, but also... It means that doing that work raised a lot of questions that I didn't have the chance to answer because of the form that that work took. So this focus on survival and endurance is really just an extension of that. Um, but one of the ways that I've been trying to get at it is by dealing with archival materials, which is something I always do just because I love, I love doing archival work. Um, but I've been really interested in Reed Erickson, who some of you may know about, right? This very wealthy trans, white trans philanthropist um, who had like a pet leopard and was super into um, mysticism, right? And sort of new age spirituality. And then there are a handful of other folks in the six, like trans figures in the sixties and seventies that had this deep engagement with new age spirituality, which I write a little bit about inside ethics at the end of the book. Um, but I'm going into, I have this big question, which is like, what does ritual and this engagement with metaphysical questions have to do with trans survival and trans endurance? Like, why is it such a common part of so many different trans lives? And what work is it doing in terms of offering resources for survival? So one of the things that I've been thinking about is like, well, it's maybe kind of obvious, but it took me a while to get to. Um, there's not really much you can point to 
in the contemporary milieu, right, or in whatever the contemporary milieu was in 1967 or 1987, um, that gives you a sense of what a world where trans life is valued is. Mm. There are small glimmers of that, right, in different collective organizing spaces, maybe, um, and in different relationships. But it's hard to be like, here's an example that we can aspire to. Let's move towards it. Um, so what has tended to happen is these desires get attached to um, to sort of spiritual, unearthly, and metaphysical considerations, or they get attached to the the far or near historical past and like revisioning of of personages um, and moments in those past. So. Yeah, so that's part of what I'm trying to think about. And I'm gonna gonna go spend a week and a half and read Erickson's archives, thinking about like, why the hell was he so into new age stuff? And what does that tell us about trans survival and endurance? Um, that's part of what's going on. And then I'm writing more about art, which is kind of new to me um, and is exciting. I'm excited by that. Dr. Ritalati has joined us. I've Hello. joined yes this was fantastic thank you so much um dr melatino for joining us and dr mcmaster your um your facilitation of the q a was fantastic we have been reading side effects as a uw system community and um, our gws interns created a really amazing um, guide that we've been using internally in our gws classrooms across the state and um you're such a beautiful writer and you you take us to all of these different nuanced aspects of um in all of your work and it was it was just really fantastic to hear your talk and then hear you think through different ideas in the q a so we appreciate your openness um, to tackling our different questions and yeah really exciting to hear about what you're working on next so thank you so much for being our guest this evening um i want to recognize and thank um carla strand for all of the amazing resources that hit chat tonight um so there's lots we'll disseminate these again after the conference but there's so many great um launching points in the chat and um, again, I want to thank our um, the people who are doing interpretation for us tonight and also CART um, for all of their dedication, not just to this event, but to all of the events that we're hosting throughout the conference. So tomorrow, the conference continues. Um, we have a full day of concurrent sessions. And at 11 a.m. Central Time, um, we're welcoming Site Black Women for a really amazing plenary that I think will have a lot of overlap um, with work that people are doing in the classroom, outside of the classroom, and that our students are engaged in. And then um, at 3 o'clock p.m., so at the end of the day, we're closing with an artist roundtable. And um, we'll drop the link to our virtual artist exhibition in chat. But it features all of the amazing work of the artists that we're featuring on our website as part of our asynchronous events. And um, we're really excited to look at their interpretations of art and artist social activism and the different lens that they're viewing that through, including um, a pretty strong perspective on disability justice as well. So that link is in the chat. We hope everybody will join us um, tomorrow and we also have events on Saturday, but for now, we just wanted to thank everybody for the time and the space and we look forward to connecting again soon. Thanks, everybody.